let's talk about values. Hey everyone, welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're gonna be discussing values. Um, thanks to a caller that I had, we had this great conversation about values. And she asked me, how do you find your values? And I was like, great fucking question. So. I actually wrote down my values like in 2019 from June 4th, 2019. I have a Google Doc. We're gonna go over and we're gonna talk about values and why you probably should have them. Before we do, I am drinking the last of one of my favorite teas. This is Witchwood Tea House. You guys know I'm obsessed. They're from Etsy. I'm not sponsored, just love them. And it's called Evening Unwind. It is definitely not evening. Shh, don't tell anybody. It is the perfect tea to end a long day. Um, I'm at, it's like noon and I'm already tired today, kids. I'm tired. So. This tea, natural ingredients, here it goes. Uh, calendula, chamomile, lavender buds, rose chips and apple, super, super delish. I actually already poured me some here. Do you wanna see my teapot today? This is one of my favorite like modern-ish teapots. It is so good. Okay, now to get into today's um, subject matter, I want you to think of values as just like the foundation you use to move your life forward. I didn't always have the same values that I have today, right? They were something that I gathered over time. Tool gathering is a big part of my content. I believe in tool gathering. I think that's what life is. I think life is an opportunity to gather tools, to have a more cohesive existence moving forward. Values is 100% a part of that. So in 2019, while I was struggling in a relationship, I messaged this doc to my then person. And I said, I would like to discuss values with you so we can know if we're really compatible. Now, these values are just mine. They're not yours, they're not anyone else's. When you create values, whether you're creating core values that are the fundamentals of your business or core values, which are the fundamentals of your existence, you're creating a literally a foundation, right? You're sort of, you're sort of like, eh, I wanna say like your script through life, but it's not a script. It's to help guide you when life gets hard. It's something that helps you decide, ooh, what do I do in this moment? What is something that's really valuable to me? So throughout my life, as I gather tools, I, you know, I really discovered that certain things are not valuable to me. Like religion is not that valuable to me, but it's kind of valuable, but it's not part of my values. So if you ask somebody who's super religious, like what are your values? They might say, well, like God and like the word of God is my values. Like what does God say about my values? But when you're a secularist or you're not in a specific bubble like that, you have to know why you believe in what you believe in. And that's a very, very, very difficult thing to come about discovering, but it takes trial and error and is possible to curate. So I'm gonna share with you this Google Doc, which I have not actually looked at since probably 2019, but we're gonna discuss it. And it's interesting, because this is a really difficult challenge. I actually had another caller who asked me, hey, what are your values? And I can't just name them like this, but he could, he could name them like this. I can't, I need to reference like um, a context or a lived situation or my Google Doc. Now, because I have not looked over this Google Doc in a while, there might be a bunch of spelling errors and maybe the sentences won't be as good, but we're gonna go through it together and I think it'd be interesting. This is a seven page doc for the reference, like for your reference. This is a seven page doc because that's how much I thought all, like I thought about this constantly, constantly, constantly. And it is something that matters to me. Like it does matter to me that I know myself and I know my values. So let's pull this up on screen here. Okay, this setup is a little weird. It's a little unorthodox, but we're gonna have to make it work, okay? So looking at this, I'm gonna be referencing my screen here. Um, you're here, so don't like worry too much about it. I know this is a podcast, but I know if you're like me, you like to watch the visual. The visual is gonna be a little off. Um, if you read ahead, that's fine too. Uh, like I said, I will be correcting myself as I <laughs> go through this with you. And then of course, like hopefully X out anything that might be doxing, though I don't think that's what's gonna happen today because I'm pretty sure this is just my values sheet. Okay, let's go. So when I was, before I, okay. When I, I created this doc because I was going through such a hard breakup in relationship that I was like, hey, are we compatible? Do we share the same values? I'm really worried we don't. And I don't know about you, but I can't live in a partnership with someone who doesn't share my values. It's just really frustrating. Now, I don't mind if they have different variations of these values, but um, I've dated people who just genuinely didn't agree with any of this. So it is what it is, right? Okay, so I said, these are for our partners, uh, live in humans and in general core beliefs are my core beliefs. If humans in my life want a limited place in my life, inner circle, but we don't live together or build a life together, but see each other on occasion, I'm open to these values being different. These are the only, th only need, wait, sorry. <laughs> these are only the needs I have for those that live with me and who are building a life with me. 
my dyslexia is about to kick in really hard. So let's just go through this. So I wrote honesty. Okay, total honesty and truth, transparency from how our bodies are feeling to where our emotions are. I need humans around me to be ready to have hard conversations with total honesty. If they cannot at the time offer truth, they must refrain from lying in state, quote, I cannot share that with, I cannot share that at this moment and I will need time before I share, end quote. Honesty is hard but necessary for me to remain sane and happy. Lying was a large part of my 20s because of survival demand it, because survival demanded it. But I do not survive anymore and therefore lying has no place in my existence with the rare exception of literally saving my life from a bad human. I need the humans around me and in my life to refrain from lying to me. Period. If they are if they are in survival mode and need to lie about their sexual orientation, religious status for work or existing in the world, that's one thing. Those lies are never allowed to be used on me. Period. No surprise birthday parties. Nothing where the humans in my life will be forced to lie. A lie includes statements made in the heat of the moment. One must have control over their words. And if they do not have this skill, they can wait until they have it to interact with me. This is a skill I know. Oh, this is a skill. And I know that I'm asking what I'm asking is hard. I have to hold myself to the standard in order to function. Informed consent is everything to me. So honesty is really important. You guys know I rant about it all the time. The reason it's so important is not just because I have borderline, but I think it's just a normal thing that most humans do want to experience. Now, if some humans don't mind the dishonesty, that's okay. I dated people in the past who were chronic liars. They did not uh, value honesty the way I did. And I know for some people it's really, really strict, but I do this because of who I am and how my brain operates. This isn't a judgment on anyone else. I'm not telling you to have my values. I'm telling you, if you want, in, if you want me, if you think you see me, then you have to agree with this to some extent, right? And I know it's outrageous because life is so complicated, shit happens. And I know shit happens. But again, this is, this is like the consistency that I need to not get triggered. So sometimes values are not just a matter of like operating with the self or the world or whatever else. It's a matter of keeping yourself, you know, functioning internally. It's not just about how you interact with problems because it, it's, it can be something so much deeper than that if you need it to be. For me, my mental health, number one, girls, number fucking one. Brittany's mental health, number one. When people lie to me, it drives me crazy. Surprise birthday parties have always given me anxiety. Not because it's unethical to have a surprise birthday party. Because, but because in order to surprise me, not only are you going to have to orchestrate and lie about something most likely, but often it's not cohesive with my like anxiety or my borderline. So I'm not opposed to people having surprise birthday parties. I just know in the past, even when I was a child, I did not like them. And I don't like them. They just feel like I'm not a part of my life. I like to feel like I'm a part of my own decisions in my life. And so someone having a surprise birthday party is hard for me to process. But my love language is quality time together. And so if somebody loves me, I just want them to spend time with me. I don't need gifts. I don't need extravagant things. I don't need surprises. I just want you to be present with me in my life, which is very difficult to do if you do not share values. Because when you're chilling with someone, even a friend, even a mother, a father, a sibling, it's going to eat at you if they don't interact with you in a way that vibes with you long term. So if you're with somebody, let's say you're with a friend who's like a thief. I had a friend who was a kleptomaniac and I didn't know this until like a couple years into our friendship, but she would lie constantly about stealing. So one time we were in an elevator and we were, um, no, no. Okay. Well, one time we went to Sally's and then at Sally's, she was borrowing a hat of mine, a little blue hat I had. And we were at Sally's and I bought some hair dye from Sally's and some scissors. On the way home in an elevator coming up, I was looking at my friend and I was like, your hair is different. It has like color in it. Did you just do that at Sally's? Like, did you, did you do your hair at Sally's in the bathroom? Because she goes to the bathroom a lot. This friend of mine in the past, I'm not friends with her anymore. She used to go to the bathroom a lot. Now it's all coming together. As I'm riding in this elevator, I'm like, holy fucking shit, my friend steals and she lies. Like I, I was so shook. So we're riding up this elevator. She goes, no, 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 you're crazy. You're literally crazy, Brittany. Nothing's wrong with my hair. And I'm like, okay. So then I was like, okay, well maybe I'm crazy because I doubt myself a fucking lot, okay? Like I really do. So I'm like, fuck, okay, maybe it is me. We get upstairs to our apartment and then in the bathroom of our apartment after she uses it, there's trash from Sally's of dye packets stuffed underneath the trash can in the bottom of the trash can. And the only reason I spotted it was because a little bit of dye was still on the side of the trash. And I was like, oh, there's like dye on the side of that trash can. <gasps> it's in the trash can. And so I dug, girls. I dug. 
to find it. And there it was. And I was like, holy fucking shit. So I confronted her and I said, what is this? And she was like, oh my God, now you dig through trash cans. I was like, oh my God, now you steal and lie to me. And I was like, this is weird, dude. Like I feel uncomfortable living in a house with somebody or or not that she wasn't living with me at the time. It was a, me and this guy had an apartment together and she was visiting. But I was like, I don't want to be in an apartment with you. Like, I'm confused about what you're doing. But then I realized she had so much trauma. I mean, this is a woman who would rant and rave about how Mexicans were, like, stealing our jobs and lying on resumes when she lied on all of her resumes to get her jobs. Never graduated high school. Would talk shit on everyone. So I get it. I get it. She had fucking zero values. But you know what she used to tell me? She used to say, you know good values. You don't have to be taught them. And I was like, oh, really? Really? Because apparently she must have missed the lesson where lying and stealing is probably a no-go. Especially when you're stealing hair dye. Like that's not a right or like that's not a life or death choice. You know, I've stolen food. Everybody knows this. I've talked about this often. And a uh 20 oh god, what year was this? Uh 20 I don't know, between 2012 and like 2016, maybe 2015, 2014. I don't remember. I was in and out of relationships, but I was really, really struggling with money. And I was working full time, but I wasn't making enough and I didn't know how to manage my money. I was struggling a lot. So I would steal food from the deli, like eat a salad or eat some chicken or like if they were going to throw away something, I would definitely eat it before I threw it away. You know, stuff like that because I was, I was desperate. Like I really was, but I can understand that. And I'm, I'm pretty lenient on people stealing food. Like I am kind of an Aladdin. So like I, I'm sort of indifferent to that, but stealing hair dye, girl. So when I think about honesty, I think about a person's ability to face themselves. And I prefer having people in my life that can face themselves, especially when they fuck up. So I think the hardest thing for me is like, I have a really core inner circle. I love them. We all have different values. And um, some of them are definitely okay with lying. Like they're like, yeah, dude, people lie all the time. People say this all the time to me. Brittany, people lie all the time. And I, I think I know what you guys mean when you say that, but I don't think you know what it sounds like to me. So when I hear people say, oh, Brittany, people lie all the time, I think of that girl in the elevator. I think what other people mean to say is, Brittany, people lie all the time, like how much they weigh or if they're wearing makeup or if they actually went to work that day. And I just, that's fine. You do you. But if you're going to be somebody that I have to deal with every day, like in my house, you either have to be able to handle me calling you like, hey, bro, I think that's a lie and you know it. Or like, hey, is that a lie? It feels like a lie. You're going to have to handle me face, like challenging you because if you can't face yourself, I don't want to face you. You know, like there's something about it that's quite disgusting. And then another part of me is so lenient on people that I understand why you're doing it. I get it. I've been there. I've been a, I've been a liar. I get it. But I don't need to do that anymore. And unless I have a gun to my head, there's no reason for me to lie. I'm, I have nothing to hide. So unless like somebody comes into this house and goes, are you a fucking faggot? Are you a queer? And I'm like, yeah, of course I'm going to lie. I'm not going to die on the, the hill of queerness. You know what I mean? But then again, look at all these women in the Middle East who are dying on the hill of hijab. So maybe I'm a pussy. Maybe I'm actually a pussy and they're not. Either way, I think people have the right in survival situations to make their own decisions. If I was in the Middle East and it was up to me like dying or wearing hijab, I'd probably just wear hijab. And then at the same time, maybe I'd wake up one day and decide, you know what? Fuck this. I'm not going to lie anymore. I'm going to be honest. I hate it. And take it off and risk dying. I'm going to sneeze. Hold on. The point is, is that sometimes life puts us in a situation to lie. So uh, like last podcast, we talk about creating environments so your, your partners don't have to lie to you. You need to create environments so your kids don't lie to you. Parents be out here right now creating, because of their values, an environment in which their children are incentivized to lie. I'll give you an example. Remember how in um, last podcast I talked about like when you pussy through a question, you ask someone like, hey, are you single right now? And so I'm just saying, hey, I want to ask you out. Are you available? You inquire first and then you get the answer. When I was a kid, um, my parents were real. they're really pretty anti-gay. They're much more lenient now. Obviously, two of their, three of their kids have come out. So they're much more lenient. But still, very Catholic, very anti-gay. So when I was like 14, I asked my mom, would you rather have like a dead child or a gay child? Actually, I might have been like 15, 14, 15. We had just moved to the country. And um, she said a dead child because a dead child would go to heaven. That's a very Catholic answer. But to a child, all I heard was that my mother wanted a dead child, right? That was really hard for me to internalize. But my mother gave 
an answer based off of her values. Her value is reaching heaven. So honesty is important to my parents. They really want to be honest. My mom always says, Betsy, I know you don't want to hear this, but I have to be honest. I don't mind if people are honest with me, but that doesn't mean I have to agree with you. Your honesty is not necessarily true. So honesty is something that comes from within that is true to you, but not objectively. And I think that that is something I'd rather hear than a lie. So I'd rather my mother tell me, yes, I'd rather have a dead child who goes to heaven than a gay child who's risking going to hell. than lying to me and saying, oh, I just want my children to be, you know, um, whoever they are. That's not true. My mom doesn't want me to be whoever I am. She wants me to be a very specific person. Just like every parent does. Every parent, I think, except for the crazies, most likely do not want their kids to be rapists and do not want their kids to be horrible people, right? I think. I hope, right? But that doesn't mean that whatever version of your parents' view of you is going to be right for you. So when you create your values, you have to ask yourself, is this coming from my bubble that I was born into? This like, this version of the matrix, as my friend Sneeko would say, or is this just the culture you were born into? And that because you're in this puddle, as my friend Destiny would say, I would say bubble, we're all in these like little scripted cultural bubbles, okay, in which we're trying to create balance, but we can't because the world is now connected, okay? So now we are getting feedback from so many people it's really hard to form your values, but keep in mind, they don't have to be objective because rarely they rarely can values be objective, right? Rarely can they be objective, especially with language being so nuanced. But you can try your best to make it as smooth as possible when explaining these things. So I wrote them down. That might not be your tactic, but that was mine. Okay, so I wrote them down so I could just hand them to people basically. But again, I've only handed this to one person and that was the person I was dating. So... Okay, consistency. Ooh, I love a consistent person. Consistency coincides with honesty, I think. If you're an honest person, I expect that consistency from you. If you lied out of the blue after being honest with me, I would be heartbroken. So consistency, I value consistency in behavior and ideas. I don't want stagnation, but I do need the humans I'm around to know themselves well enough to at least offer consistency for a year. And as they grow, they need to inform me of that growth. Personal growth is one thing. Changing values every month is another. I need humans around me who know their foundations well enough not to shake mine, okay? This is very important. So many people will come into your life and be on a different journey than you. They won't be this in the same place as you. So they're going to almost want you to be where they are. I actually think Ethan Klein has this problem where I think he's a misery loves company kind of person. He's a good person but he's sort of a misery loves company person at the same time. I don't think he's evil, but I think when he's miserable, he wants other people to be miserable. I've noticed this with what, how he treats Hassan. Ignoring Hassan's eating disorders and just encouraging him to binge is such a bad friend move. But Ethan, because he's so miserable, probably just wants Hassan to also be as miserable as him, which is sad. But I don't think it necessarily comes from an evil place. It comes from a weak place because Ethan's a weak human, you know? So he has no consistency with his values. Ethan will say, oh, we should make fun of people with eating disorders, but then encourage his friend to have one. It's like, bro, like why? I don't even, you're so, you know, mental health matters, but not when it comes to your friend who's literally hosting leftovers with you. Strange. Okay. So I gave an example. My partner's an atheist when we get married, but three years later, they find God and convert to Catholicism. I would see this as a consistent, I would see them as consistent until they grew into someone else. As long as they keep me posted and let me know they have found a new spiritual path, I will not feel betrayed and I will be able to make a new decision about them in my life. Because the existence of, because the existence of God is about reality differences, I cannot be with someone who lives in a reality where God is real. It would be inconsistent with my reality. So in terms of dating, I can't date somebody who believes in something I don't as radically as a God, right? That really changes how we want to have kids, how we raise, um, how, you know, if I'm on OnlyFans, if I'm queer, like all of these things really can change based off of a person's path. Now, obviously, if I'm dating someone, of course I'm open to them changing. I understand even if I'm married to someone, they could change. Okay, that's beautiful. I hope we change either together or I hope you're not keeping your change a secret from me. Talk to me. Tell me what you're going through. If you're my parent or my sibling, I respect that you're going to have a change that I might not be privy to, but I hope you let me know when things do change so I can celebrate with you. I want to celebrate people's choices. And if somebody in my life wants to be Catholic or Muslim or Mormon or something, 
great, I love that for you. Does that mean you need to raise your kids with me? Does that mean you need to marry me? Does that mean we need to live together? Does that mean we need to talk all the time? I have an older brother that I love so much, but him and I, um, he does not love to hear my BDSM stories, let me tell you. But he will talk to me sometimes about like sex and porn addiction and the problems with it. But then when I say, well, you know, he'll like one time he mentioned, um, he's like, have you ever heard of this thing called BDSM? Like, Brittany, people like hurt each other. And I'm like, ooh, have I heard of it? Psh, bitch, I am it, bitch. And so when I told him that, I was like, I have to tell you something. I'm definitely in BDSM. And he's like, oh my God, bro. Like he, could, he just had the hardest time seeing me for a second. And then he kind of got over it-ish, but asked me not to bring it up again. This is pretty consistent with his values. My brother is not offensive to me because he's consistent. He has consistently always disliked hearing about my sex life. And to him, BDSM is sex. And so if I talk about BDSM, he's going to feel icky. So to maintain a healthy relationship with my brother, which we have, I don't mention BDSM and he doesn't bring it up. It's a win-win situation, right? Okay, reliability. <sighs> Words matter to me as do actions. I need words to follow actions. I value my word and would like to honor it by being reliable when I speak. Your word is your bond. I feel like actions matter absolutely, absolutely. But I would love to live in a world where people's words match their actions and their actions match their word. That's not always going to happen and none of us are perfect. Like I said, in my 20s, I told horrible lies to keep jobs, to get out of jobs, to get good recommendations. Never because I wasn't actually worth the recommendation, but because I knew that if I quit certain jobs, people were going to get angry at me and then write me a bad recommendation for leaving for not a quote unquote good reason, right? So for me, I'm always trying to recognize that past Brittany had to do what she did. I'm ashamed of it, but I also can't beat her up any more than anyone else. Who am I to go to survival Brittany and tell her you should have just been poor, you should have just starved? She was already doing that. She already did do that and it sucked. It sucked. So instead, I give, I have leniency for people who are struggling. I just really do. So that's just within my values is to take into consideration the context of a situation. Again, if you're not in a survival mode, like a real survival mode, I'm less leaning on you and it's just how it goes, you know? Um, okay, so reliability. Um, okay, I might become unreliable when I'm in an episode, but I hope I have tools to have the tools like needing space and meditating when I'm unable to be my mindful self or Brittany's sober mind. So I call my, um, uh, my brain like a sober Brittany when I'm not triggered and the way that when I am triggered, I kind of feel like I'm intoxicated by the mania in my brain, right? The borderline. So I try really hard to maintain tools like, um, I think I gave an example here. Where is it? Um, okay, I understand with mental illnesses, this isn't always smooth, but I can inform the humans around me within the day within the day of my current state. I will also gain better tools as I continue forward. I want to rely on my partners, the humans in my life, to do uh, what they say and not to overpromise. I really hate overpromising. This includes quote, "Yes, honey, I'll take out the trash," and quote, "Take it out, take it out, bitch. Don't forget. Don't get distracted. Just." take out the trash. I really need consistency and reliability in my life. So you see how honesty, reliability, and accountability, or sorry, well, this says accountability, but if you scroll up, um, this right here, honesty, consistency, and reliability all move into each other. So do you see I'm forming my values in a way that all coincide with one another? Not just because I'm doing it for funsies. They actually make sense. Like I'm really proud of past Britney. 2019 Britney was fucking based. Like, this is really good. I haven't edited this. And you guys know, I talk about this shit all the time. So I haven't really, I've been pretty consistent with my values, I feel. I'm actually really proud of myself for this. So, um, because 2019 Brittany, you guys all know, she was a mess before she went to go live on the farm with Farm Brother. Yeah, this was, this is pretty good. So, um... Yeah, this is, I'm really happy about this actually. Okay, accountability. I'm only interested in being my best, which means when I'm challenged for my ideas or beliefs, it is not my job to be offended by introspective. I will always consider that I could be wrong and will do what, will do what I can to make amends if it is true. I need humans around me who will not get defensive when they are being held accountable. I need humans who will see that their actions are, to, are not honest, consistent, or healthy and make amends. I need partners who understand that my life is public and I need partners who will go on a journey with me of admitting their faults, owning up to them no matter where we are. I do not want to be haunted by my past, but own up to it. 
I really like the idea of just saying it. I was a liar in my 20s. It's so freeing. Say it with me. I fucking lied. I stole food. I did whatever it took to survive. And fuck, like, it feels good to finally admit it. Because I was, like, carrying this shame and weight with me for years. For what? For what? For nothing. The moment I forgave myself and allowed myself to just accept the fact that I did what I had to do, it became so much easier to accept the fact that I didn't have to do it anymore. Does that make sense? Sometimes when we don't hold ourselves accountable, we we end up in a loop of self-deception that makes us continue the thing that we don't even want to do in the fucking first place, but now we're doubling down. So the moment I could hold myself accountable, thank God for DBT therapy, so helpful, but the moment I could do that, I just became so much more forgiving to everyone around me, but especially myself. Um, I need partners who understand. Oh, sorry, I read that. Um, there are some subjects that I understand are off limits and those can be discussed. But if the actions of my partners affect me and I and have made it so that I've had to change my life because of it, I retain the right to talk about those subjects on videos, in books, on talk shows and so on. I know this is personal and hard for humans, but I'm um, I am marinating worm food and one day I'm going to die. I'm not interested in living a life where I pretend certain things have never happened. Please note, if my partners do not want to be public figures themselves, they do not have to be, they retain the right to privacy. So if I'm dating somebody and they do not want to have our stories told, that's fine. We'll discuss what details they want me to leave out, but I can't leave out the details of my life. Like I can't not, not share that I'm dating someone or in love or I'm going to have a kid. Like how could I not share that on a channel where I talk about my life? And I've done this my whole life. I remember there was a guy when I was 22, there was a guy in my friend group who like wanted to have sex with me for my first time. And I asked him, I was like, can I talk about this on YouTube? Because I want to talk about my first time. And he's like, no, you can't tell anyone, not your friends, nobody. You can't tell anyone we've had sex. And I was like, oh, no, thank you. I only came to find out why he wanted to keep it a secret because he was fucking all the girls in the group and he didn't want everyone to find out. So he would tell all the girls to keep it quiet. And then finally, when I was like, hey, like, that's a fucked up thing to ask somebody to do. Like, it, anyways, one thing led to another and everybody realized he was just fucking everybody. And that's why he wanted it a secret. Funny. Okay. Informed consent. I value informed consent, not just consent. So example, can I spank you? Yes. That's good consent. Okay. Informed consent. May I speak you on your bottom, bottom hard enough to leave a handprint five times or until you cry? You may spank. The conversation continues. You may spank me hard enough to leave a mark, but not enough to make me cry. Please start slow and will you save words to see where my limits are? Informed consent means that when a decision is made, there are no regrets or if there are regrets, that peace is made about it. If we only negotiate for things to go well, we do not have informed consent. In BDSM, there's always this idea that was taught to me that informed consent is the consent of knowing it could go great and it could go wrong. Especially in BDSM where things are risky. It's like signing up for the military, boot camp. Girl, you could break an ankle, okay? If you do a mud, 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 rut, mud rudder, mud rudder, mud hut, what is that thing called where they do the, the obstacle courses? It's like if you do those, you know you could hurt yourself, right? It's just a matter of making sure. It's not a matter of actually wanting to do harm or avoid accountability if harm is done. But how much better would life be if we just kind of like we're a little bit more cautious? But risk aware kink means that you're open. Your risk th uh, threshold might be larger or smaller. You know, informed consent matters. Risk aware kink is really important to me because I think it's really good. But safe, sane, and consensual is also really good. I think in combination, you can take these two BDSM sayings and mantras and sort of bring them together with, um, I want to be risky, but I want to be informed about my risk, right? It's having those conversations that allow this to happen. Okay. I really like that. Brittany. Pass Brittany, girl. She was on it. Okay. Um, let me see. <sighs> um, okay. Things will go wrong. That's life. Life is hard. We need to make sure we're prepared as we can. And when we're surprised by life, it must be we must be ready to handle it and not crumble when it's hard. If we're in an episode or triggered, we must take the time to better our minds and come back to the issue. We cannot tackle hard subjects, high, drunk, sleep deprived, well in an episode or at any time where later on, oh, later one of my humans can claim, oh, where later on one of my, that sentence, that sentence is weird. Or at any time later, one of my humans can claim they weren't able to consent for reals. Even your adult, wait, e oh, either you're adult enough to consent, sane enough to consent, ready enough to consent, or we aren't ready to be doing things we want. I think this is really hard for people to process and it's very, very nuanced. So there are stages in life. I feel like 
life is really messy and people don't always know what they want until they've done it. I used to think soap in my mouth would be sexy, like a soap bar, like, oh, daddy, I've been bad. Um, Soap in my mouth makes me puke, which I did not discover till I had done it. So I, I can only consent so much, right? It's like when you get a tattoo done, it's like I consent to getting a tattoo, but what if you get a tattoo done and you realize, oh, I actually fucking hate this and I don't consent anymore. Is that tattoo artist like a rapist tattoo artist for your tattoo? No, they're just a person who thought you had the information, but you didn't even have it. So we have to be open to ourselves being the reason we don't have the greatest time, right? This is, ex- this is like, this is meant to avoid rape and unconsensual behavior. This is meant to avoid pain. So some people might be seeing this and be like, oh, Brittany's trying to get out of being held accountable. Brittany is trying to avoid ever being in a situation where I need to be held accountable by being such a good person that maybe I can avoid it. But I can't because life is hard and I'm gonna make mistakes. You're gonna fuck up. You're gonna fuck up. Don't fuck with me. You're gonna fuck up. This idea that we need like perfect leaders and perfect priests and perfect YouTubers and perfect... As the great philosopher Beyonce said, perfection is a disease of a nation. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, Okay, so my partners must be ready to tackle the complicated and serious issues that life can present. And if they don't have the skills, they need to inform me so I can act accordingly. You're not even doing it. Okay, so there's my consent. Let's say I'm asking my partner, hey, can I brand you? Can I do scarification? I have two scarification uh, pieces done on my thighs. I'm a big fan of like tattoos and scarification and all that stuff. So if I ask my partner, can I do scarification on you? Um, I'm asking for them to be able to know if they can also help me avoid being traumatized. Because what if I do scarification on my partner and then they're like, they go crazy from it and they're like, I can't believe you did this to me. You destroyed my body. Fuck, that's going to traumatize me. So can we just like avoid all of this by you being self-aware enough to say, you know what? I'm not sure I'm ready for that. When you tell me I'm not sure I'm ready for that, I go, great. Let me know when you are or if you ever are. And if you're never, I don't care. We just won't do it, boo-boo. That's okay. But that's the thing. I'm trying to create an environment, going back to last week's podcast, I am trying to create an environment where my partners are allowed to say no. You're not going to get punished for saying no. Like, that's not what I want. I don't want to facilitate an environment where people can't say no. Say no if you don't want to do it. And then be okay with me also being able to walk away. Or not walk away. Look, Brittany is never going to ditch her partner because they won't do scarification. I don't give a fuck about scarification. It's not an important thing to me. But maybe um, I want kids. So if I ask a person, do you want kids? And they say no, I think that's kind of fair for me to walk away. But somebody might say, no, you're manipulating and you're using blackmail. And oh, you're like gaslighting them into having kids. It's like, no, I'm just saying maybe you want me, but maybe it's not even the real me. Because if you date me and you think Brittany doesn't want to become a mother... Are you dating Britney? Are you dating a version of Britney in your head, right? So again, this is to facilitate open communication and to say, this is the life I want for my future. It's the life I want to facilitate. Okay, inner peace. The goal of existence must be to find peace. This is for me, not you. I'm not interested in living a life as an angsty teen. And though I respect the journey we must all face, I'm done with that stage of my life. When I am in a mindful and sober headspace, I'm not worried about my choices because I make them with inner peace. So what I mean by this is I'm not struggling anymore with myself about shame or guilt. I'm just asking myself, hey, are we moving within our values? And then that itself can be a little gray and confusing and there's a lot of up and down emotions. Like I really struggle with now that I have lupus, should I be able to have a child if I can give that child lupus? But then I have people in my life that are like, yeah, Brittany, you should definitely have kids even if there's a slight crazy chance your kids could get it because at the end of the day, that's just how life goes. And I think that's probably true. When I think about my past days of like uh, my anti-children days, I used to be very anti-having kids. Um, because I had gone from wanting kids to being like the planet's overpopulated back to saying you know what we're animals evolve over time fuck it I'm allowed to have kids because girl that's what I was put on this planet to do Mm -hmm. I was put on this planet to be a mother so I'm gonna make that happen whether it's through my youtube channel or through you know helping people in the local neighborhood volunteering for library readings or physically having children or adopting I'm gonna be a mother somehow Um, but my choices, because I have peace, because I make them within my values. 
and I only want them for me. I really don't want to project this onto anyone else. The last thing I want to do is protect is project my values and morals onto you. I don't want to do that. That sounds like my living hell. I don't want you to do that to me. Please, please don't think I'm doing it to you. That's not my intent. This is just mine. This doesn't have to be yours, okay? So sacrifice. Nothing in life is with uh, is a sacrifice anymore. I do not, I do what I want when I want and how I want. If I need to make more money or sleep more to have what I want, I do that. But it's not a sacrifice to live my life. It's a blessing. I want humans around me to realize that their light, that light, sorry, whoa. I want humans around me to realize their life is hard, but it's about surviving, not, oh, it's, it's about living, not surviving. You've heard me say this a thousand times. Obviously, while we're living, we're not surviving. I'm not surviving anymore. Like, thank God, thank the universe, thank everybody, thank you, thank every, like literally, I'm gonna cry. I'm not surviving anymore. And because I'm not surviving, I have the ability to like literally be so grateful for life, right? But I earned that by surviving my survival. Like I earned that, right? So I get to live this life. Like I, I already did it for 30 years. I fucking lived my life and then I got it. And so I've, I've only been really happy and, and joyful like the last few years, right? So um, obviously it continues. I've spent most of my life surviving. So I'm not here to rush anyone. If someone is still in survival mode and they don't know how to live, they must gain the skill before promising me that they understand the difference. I personally never knew what living was until I did it. And I didn't start until last year. So when I wrote this in 2019, um, it was about the 2018 time that I was getting into living. But truly, I don't think Brittany completely really did this until she um, till she did this, like this paper that I sent to then my partner, it really changed everything. Cause when he wrote me back his values, they were non-existent. When he wrote me back his values, they were like contextual the whole time. Like, well, if someone lies to me, I'm going to lie to them. If someone steals from me, I'm going to steal from them. I'm like, that's not a, sir, this is not values, but he was still in survival mode, but it was very unique to have a person write down their values and have them be like a, a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. That's not how I fuck. Like, that, well, that's a weird way to say that. That's not how I do things. That's not how I fuck. What the fuck? That's just not how I do things. That's just not how I do things. I try really hard to think, well, how can I move in kindness and in warmth? You know, what, what, what would the ideal version of Britney do? Would she be considerate and thoughtful or would she lash out? Sometimes I lash out, you know, but I try not to. Okay. Discipline. Oh, I love, mm, mm, I love discipline. Okay. Discipline. No excuses, just explanations. I got this from my therapist. She was like, you need to go tell people you have borderline and apologize to them for hurting them. You need to explain that you did these things because you have borderline, but you cannot use your borderline as a get out of responsibility card. And I was like, yes, ma'am. So I could not use it as an excuse, just an explanation. I live my life with great discipline and this helps limit my episodes. I have a very consistent schedule that allows me to sleep on time, work on time, um, self-care time, intimate time with humans in my life, housework responsibilities and hobbies. Today, it's about 1 p.m. And to be honest with you, I'm already fucking exhausted. I did laundry. I'm packing to go on a trip. So when you guys see this, I'll have already been on my trip for a bit. Um, I'm really tired. Like, to be honest with you, I'm like, I'm on the verge of crying just because I'm exhausted. I'm not even mentally in a bad place. I'm just so fucking tired. <laughs> but I'm not even tired because of anything other than my like chronic health right now because of the lupus. Like it's really fucking draining me, but that's okay. And it's gonna be fine. And see, I'm not even like, I'm not even sad. I'm literally crying because I'm exhausted, <sighs> but it's okay. I'm gonna sleep so good the next two weeks. <sighs> okay, so. It's, it's great. Like, it's fine. But like, do we understand, like, if you've dealt with chronic, um, like, mental illness, you know the difference between your body just being exhausted, exhausted, so you cry, and, like, your borderline coming up, and then you want to cry? It's different. Okay. Um, my goal is to be strong, healthy, and ready for whatever life throws at me. I don't want to be one bill away from my life ending. I can't tell you how many times... I did not pay rent on time. I had zero dollars in my accounts. My car got taken. My car, my, my phone got taken. My credit score was like 400. My life was a mess. I was picking up pennies on the sidewalks, trying to get enough to get food for the day, which was a croissant and some chicken salad, which was like $1.50. And that was my food for the whole day. 
And um, yeah, I just never really want to go back there again. And so I just really hope I never have to for whatever reason, right? That's kind of the goal. But it's also the goal not to be so scared of being poor again that I never allow myself to take risks. So I'm okay if I'm if I'm ever down to zero dollars again, I know I'm going to be fine. I've done it a thousand fucking times. I can do it again. I have gone from a thousand, like zero dollars in my account to 50K a year to 80K a year. I can do it again. I can do it again. I've done it a hundred times. I can do it again. One more time isn't going to kill me. It's just, I just hope I never have to do it again. And props to everyone who's in that stage of life because I feel you. I don't want my life so entangled with a human that I'm, that them dying or them leaving me will ruin everything I've built. I do not want humans around me who make excuses for their bad behavior. When I talk about getting a divorce and that's devastating for me, it will be. It will not shatter my life. I will not drink myself to death. I will not kill myself. I've seen it happen time and time again. I will accept the fact that a human being is allowed to consent or revoke consent at any time, including during our marriage, and they may divorce me. I would prefer they didn't. I would prefer to use language in my romantic gestures towards them as, you're not allowed to leave. I love you. You are the love of my life. I would love to be able to use possessive language without anyone actually thinking I wouldn't let them leave. Consent is the fundamental part of my value system. If you do not have the consent to leave, then I'm just a bad person, right? But now that we've settled that, I want to be able to, as a love, as a gesture of love, and I need to hear it from my partner too. I do need that sort of very consistently, especially since I borderline, like talk about abandonment issues. I do need strong language from my partner to say, I love you. I'm not leaving you. We're not getting divorced. In order for me to to be, like almost believe them, but also it, it just helps. It feels really nice to have someone hold you and say, I love you more than anyone in the world and I would never imagine leaving you. Even though we know in 50 years and 30 years and 20 years, maybe something might happen and they might wake up one day and be like, I think I'm gonna become a Muslim. And I'm like, oh fuck, okay, that's, okay. <laughs> I accept this, but I reject this as my life. Girl eats pork, girl has an OnlyFans. Girl ain't about to worship no God, you know? So I get it. I get that that could happen. Um, I, you know, I understand. So I, I want people to understand you can have very black and light, black, black and white language that sounds toxic, which some toxic relationships are. You have to love me. You have to be with me. You can never leave me. Okay. When you do things out of fear, the fear of losing someone, you suffocate them. They, you push them away. I don't want to do that. I want to say, I love you. I'm here. Choose me if you want to choose me and choose me every day, you know? Okay. Kindness. I love kindness. I hate niceness. That's like for fake waspy people. Kindness comes from the worth with warmth within you. Kindness. Kindness is very important. I want my partners to be kind and for me um, to be kind to them. I cannot have partners who yell at me, call me names, insult to cause pain, bring up my past father, uh, mother, family, or anything not related just to hurt me. I cannot have a partner who doesn't have their anger under control. I cannot have a partner who does not have their um, sadness under control. I cannot have a partner who does not have their emotions and actions under control. If there are episodes involved, everyone needs to be ready to stop conversations and continue when we can be mindful and kind. So notice that I'm specifying not only kindness, but consideration. I really should change that to kindness and consideration. But um, when I say I can have a partner who's not under, like who doesn't have their anger under control, what I mean is outside of an episode, outside of a trigger in which I expect you to get your shit under control, you know, kind of within or outside the, you know, before, after, somewhere, you know, um, I just like, this is normal Brittany talking, la la la, normal Brittany. If normal Brittany outside of an episode just started yelling at people, like, you fucking cunts, do you, don't you think there's something wrong with that? Does anyone think that's crazy? But if somebody's having a trigger in a grocery store and is like, get away, you fucking cunts, like maybe in that situation, we might allow leniency because there's a reason, right? It doesn't have to be a diagnosable reason. It doesn't have to be, I have borderline. It can be, hey, I had a fucking panic attack today, a trigger. Perfectly healthy people experience psychosis, experience mania, experience these things sometimes once in their life, not related to mental illness but related to a moment in time in which there was a miscommunication with their brain. We see this all the time with people who are driving, uh, people who are even texting. Sometimes my brain just farts. Like I'll be in the middle of a live show and my brain will just be like blah, blah, blah. Our brains are very complicated things and the littlest thing, like a lack of sleep, 
I read this article that said a lack of sleep causes you to see people more ugly and malicious than they are. Just not getting enough sleep. And y'all know this overworked country that is America is sleep deprived. Look at me crying on a podcast because I'm sleep deprived. Only it's my own fucking fault because I have a lot of guilt over sleeping too much because it makes me feel like I'm lazy. But the problem is now that I have lupus, I have to sleep longer, up to 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, which sounds outrageous because I'm used to seven or eight hours a day. And so it's like, it's a, it makes me feel lazy sleeping an extra three hours. So now I'm trying to do a go to bed by nine, wake up at six, seven. Like it's really hard but I'm getting through it, okay? So I'm working through it, I'm forgiving myself, I'm patting myself on the back for trying, and I'm understanding that every day is gonna be a new day, and I'm gonna do the best I can until I can't anymore. And then I'm gonna allow myself to settle, okay? I've been, my brothers are helping me immensely, and my person is helping, you know, it's working out, but it's really hard. Even now, even with the state of joy that I am in, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I gotta get so much done though. Like even now, I'm on the last day at home. I have to film two podcasts. I have to edit them. And then I get to just like chill for two weeks. I did my four weeks of hustle, two weeks off. My nutritionist told me this. My business ladies have told me this. You go four weeks hustle, two weeks off. You need a break. It doesn't matter if you're not hitting your goals, you need a break, you'll burn out. And I'm really trying to avoid hardcore burnout on top of the lupus, right? We thought the lupus was burnout, by the way. When I first had problems, um, people were pretty sure it was burnout. Um, the burnout is being caused by me overworking because of the lupus. I would never have experienced burnout at this working rate because it's it's not a lot. I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's not a lot of work, right? It's not It's not enough to burn me out. Um, so knowing that is also really hard for me. Like I wasn't prepared to have lupus on top of borderline and PTSD and everything else. So I have to like forgive. I have to be kind with myself. Even though I fucking hate it. Like I almost want to beat my lupus out of me. My brother goes, just tell yourself you don't have it. And I was like, I got, that's genius. It's not working. Why isn't it working? Cause that's the hope. The hope is we can tell ourselves not to be sad. Don't de be depressed. Just think yourself out of it. You can't. You have to work yourself out of it. Sometimes work, like my nutritionist says. <laughs> She's so cute. She told me, Brittany, what do you consider work? And I said, anything that has to do with posting online, being online, YouTube related, Discord, Patreon, anything to do with the online world. She goes, do you know work is also resting? And I said, excuse me, ma'am. She goes, you need to rest as a part of your work schedule. And I was like, <gasps> I don't know if I can do that. She was like, you need to learn how to rest as a part of your work schedule so you don't feel lazy because if you get enough rest, you're gonna hustle even better tomorrow. And it's true, I've been wasting hours of my day because I've been so tired. Instead of just like hustling for eight hours a day and taking a break and just stopping work, I've been going for 15 hours a day, but because I'm not being as efficient with my time, I'm actually wasting a lot of it. So. Now, instead of not seeing a lot of movies with my brothers like I want to because I can't justify the time, I'm now going to just end work at a normal time and try very hard not to work, okay? And my brothers are helping me by saying, get down here, leave your phone upstairs, let's like, let's hang out. Because I don't want to be that phone girl. I don't want to be the girl that can't spend time with her family because I'm on the phone. And I thought I had already gotten rid of that. But I, that, I slipped right into the habit again this last month because when I'm in hustle mode, it's hard not to slip into it. But even in hustle mode, you have to, you have to, you have to end your work day. Very, very hard, very hard for us working types, very hard. Okay, do no harm, I'm an adult. I know when I'm causing harm based off of the information given to me about the limits of those around me. I speak in, I speak in black and white terms. I'm only interested in solving problems and being aggressive about it. I do not want to cause harm. If my partners need me to speak in a way that is unnatural to me, I cannot offer that kind of companionship. What I mean to say is, Brittany has a lot of modes of being, but I'm Brittany. I talk with a very like, mm, attitude. I end my sentences with a period. I can be calm and warm and compassionate, but I have my limitations. Your girl ain't soft, okay? Because I'm not a soft person. I'm a little rough around the edges. If you need someone who's like, hi, how are you? I'm, I've missed you so much. You're like so beautiful and I just think you're so nice and let me slightly touch you here. Like, that's just not who I am. There are girls like that, there are men like that, there are people like that. I've met them, they're so nice. They're like soft people at their cores. Ain't me, bitch, so don't date me, bitch. If you want me to be that bitch, bitch. Like, literally not gonna happen, okay? Thank you. 
Um, okay, life is hard without us pretending to be someone we aren't. Life is hard enough. All right, bitches? You don't need to be out here pretending you're someone you're not. It's hard enough. It's literally so fucking hard. It's so fucking hard. You do not need to fucking add a layer onto it. But I understand we go through lying phases, so it happens. Okay. I cannot pretend to be someone I'm not. There are moments in life where talking slowly and offering patience is key, but mostly I believe that problems need to be tackled, period. Tools need to be gained and stagnation is not allowed. I was just talking to a homie about this where I'm very much like solution, 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 solution. But it's very ENTJ of me, right? It makes total sense. But other people are like, hey, I don't need solutions. I just need comfort right now. So my homies and I started to do a new thing where when they call me, they're like, hey, I'm really going through it. I go, stop. Do you need me to be comfort, Brittany? Harsh, Brittany? Solutions, Brittany? Like which version of Brittany do you need me to be so I can just like get into that headspace? Because sometimes my friends will call me and be like, this thing happened and I just cannot jump on board with their complaining because they're saying things they don't mean. So sometimes a friend will say like, I wish you would just buy me flowers. And I'm like, okay, is this really about flowers? Because you've never cared about flowers before. And they're like, yeah, I just wish you would buy me flowers. And I'm like, but you don't even like flowers. Like you literally don't like getting gifts. So what is this really about? And she's like, you're not listening to me. Or he'll be like, you're not listening to me. I I want them to buy me flowers. And I'm like, do you mean you want them to spend more quality time with you? And they're like, yes, that's what I said. Girl, that is not what you said. But I get you. I get the energy you're pushing out at me. You're not giving me, I want him to buy me flowers energy. You're giving me, you want him to spend quality time with you energy. But sometimes we're so scared to ask for what we really want. We say, can you buy me flowers? And can you bring them to me? (gasps) Which will force them to be at your house. And oh, well, can you come in for a second while I put the flowers in a vase? And oh, can you sit down on the couch while we talk? And oh, boom, quality time. Or you could just say, hey, love. I love flowers, but you know what I love more? You. Could you spend some time with me? Do you want to sit on the couch and cuddle? You want to watch some anime? Want to play footsie? I really like quality time with you. Can you do this with me? And then if they're like, no, I'm actually really busy. I'm at work 15 hours a day. I actually, quality time is not one of my love languages. Um, I can't do this for you. Break up with them or be okay with who they are, right? Why are you all making each other suffer by staying together? Mm. Um, (laughs) okay. In order to do no harm, I have my values reflected by my partners and those who live in my space. I have one life and I do want, I do not want to spend it walking on eggshells in my own home. When I come home, I want to just be myself, girls. I want to be able to say things, feel things. I want to be able to rant. I want to, I want to be able to like not even be PC. I want to be able to like, you have ever seen those therapy scream rooms where you get into a room and you just like, wow, like you scream on the top of your lungs. I want to be able to do that when I'm in my own home without anyone freaking out on me and being like, what are you doing? I'm like, look, men go to the gym. I want to scream. Is that okay? Can that be okay, please? But I don't want to walk on eggshells around my people. Like when I'm at my mom's house, I curate my language to my mother. I'm walking on eggshells to some extent. Not really. I just can't say fuck. You know what I mean? And I can't like do, I can't like dress like a hoe at my mom's. So that's a version of walking on eggshells. I just don't want in my actual home, you know? Hmm. Your girl needs some more. Girls, I'm so tired, but this is really working out, huh? This is fun. I'm, I hope you guys like this podcast. This is different. So I hope it's good for you guys. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if my partners have their own path and are working on their limitations, that's valid, but it will limit how I interact with them. And I need to see, I will need to see growth in order to remain confident in their honest ability to be better. I am not here to cast judgment on their journey. I'm only here to state my limitations as a human and give, and given my limited time on earth, I want to exist how I want. So do we understand that I'm really trying hard not to project my values onto anyone? I'm not trying to hold anyone hostage. I'm trying to say who I am. I'm open, but I have boundaries. Boundaries are about me. They're not about you, right? So don't lie in order to date me, in order to trick me into loving you. You know what I mean? It's, It's like I'm asking the world for honesty and the world's like, but then again, I feel like I've really found it. So I feel really lucky. Like I feel like I'm really getting this for the once in my life. I feel like I actually am communicating this clearly to someone and they understand and agree. Okay. 
Uh, reality. Ooh, reality. Okay. My partners and humans I live with must agree on reality. We must all truly exist in the same reality. Now, this is not roommates. At the time I wrote this, I was poly. So I think I was more or like thinking about poly situations. I'm monogamous um, currently. So I, I, I don't want anyone to think like this has to do with like roommates. I don't give a fuck what my roommates believe or my friends or my, my siblings or I don't care what you guys believe. Uh, so I, I just, you know, understand that with a caveat. Okay. Um, we must all truly exist in the same reality. Okay. There is a physical world that is objective. And then there are the realities we all choose to exist in. Example, BDSM is a lifestyle and a way of living in, wait, BDSM as a lifestyle and a way of living is a reality I choose to live in. I do not date vanillas and I do not live in a reality. Wait, and I do, wait, sorry. I do not live in that reality at my core. I survive in vanilla culture. I do not live with it, live in it. So like I'm BDSM. I need that in my relationships. I think it's important. Also, I gotta, I gotta fluff my hair. It's like, it's actually gonna form wrong if I don't. Sorry. Curly hair moment. Okay. Don't get too sticky. Thank you. Okay. So I need, um, I need to people to know, like, I'm not vanilla. I can't date a vanilla person. I'm kinky and I like sex and I want my person to be kinky or BDSM, right? So BDSM, some people take really seriously, like, BDSM is the most real thing ever, but it's just a construct. A bunch of people came together and said, let's do BDSM. Let's call it a thing. Let's make a culture and a society around it. But it's not like a, it's not like something natural. It's just something we curated, which is fine, but it's not like objective. It's just a subjective experience we're all having calling it BDSM. Another example would be God does not exist. I cannot be with someone who believes God exists. It's a different reality. <clears throat> okay, let's keep going. Reality with time, love, and energy. My partners and live-in humans must have rational limitations on their time, hearts, and energy. I don't want strangers, one-night stands, humans we've only known for a few months in my home, around my kids, or near my pigs. I will, that's a farm life reference. I have a limit of how many adults live, will live in my home and who gets to who gets a say. I cannot build a life with more than two humans as my primary partners. I wrote this when I was poly. Um, this is my limitation, but it, it must also be the limit for my partners to an extent. I want kids and a long life of consistency. And if my humans are always dating, always looking, always open to more partners, this will not allow stability for my kids or my life. I do not date online, have first date, um, I do not date online, have first dates, and I am not interested in meeting new humans with the intention of dating them. <clears throat> the reason I wrote this the way I did, it's kind of sloppy, is because at the time, oh, listen to this, I do not want humans in my life that are always looking for potential partners. I want closed poly, not open poly. Okay, so this is literally like Polly Brittany talking. I did want closed poly. I did want to raise my kids with multiple partners, um, but not a revolving door. The studies have come out. Kids really need stability, people. So to the best of our abilities, and because I can curate my life the way I want, I'm trying to facilitate that. Now, the second or last paragraph says, this isn't a judgment on those who practice open poly, but I've done that and it doesn't work for me. <clears throat> True. I'm a traditionalist. I've only, I have only so many spoons and so much heart to go around and meeting new partners all the time is, a, is more than I can handle. Life is short and I don't want to spend it getting to know humans just to have them leave over and over again. Um, I was living in a situation where my partner was like a revolving door poly person, new people every fucking weekend in my house, in my bed, come everywhere. I'm like, okay, guys, I'm exhausted. Fuck. Oh my God. And even now I'm exhausted. Like, my uh, brothers, when I date people, are always like, do they hike? Do they go outside? Do they socialize? Girl, I don't even do that anymore. At the time in my life, I have been social and different, a different, socially different at different times. So I've been more open to socialization. I loved hosting. But now at this point in my life, I want to see my friends once a year in the summer for a barbecue at the farm. I do not want to see people during the winter. I live in a place that snows. I just want to be here be with my family. And then during the summer, I want all my friends to feel like, yes, that's time to go to Brittany's house. Come fuck with me, bros. Come hang out. Come eat barbecue. Come chill. Come smoke. It'll be great. But I, when I wrote this at the time, I was much more open to a different life than I am now. So this is a little outdated, but you can see where Brittany was going. I'm trying to create stability and consistency. I'm trying to actually have an existence that I can communicate to myself and others um, because I, I need that consistency. I'm gonna sneeze. That sneeze, it really took it out of me if I'm being honest. <coughs> oh my gosh, that was a really hard sneeze. Okay, <sighs> let's keep going. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, uh, anything on my face? Anything on my face? Okay, authenticity. I value realness. I am a public figure and I choose every day not to sens sensationalize my life. 
My life is odd, but I'm serious about legal representation and I believe in the dignity of it. I cannot be with humans who want to make our life a joke or clickbait title, funny branding, a, a funny branding ploy to make more money. Money is not important to me. I do not value it. I do not need tons of it. I need enough to care for my family and I cannot be with humans who values money, um, who hoards it. I plan to make the money I need to live my life and the rest I'm giving away to others. Now, when I say this, it's because I was also raised this way. I was raised in a bubble in which you have an abundance of money, you give it away. And I'm not saying that <coughs> you have to give it away. I'm saying I like and appreciate that I am not a dragon and I do not hoard money. I need make enough to make my living and I want enough to um, give my kids a good life, but I don't need a huge abundance of it. I just watched um, Roman Atwood talk about that on Impulsive. He's like, how much money do I really need to have a good life? Like how much is ever gonna be enough? And that is the question we all have to ask ourselves. When is it enough? For me, I, I don't go by a number. I go by this, um, the way we want to exist. So in my head, if I tell myself, I'm going to send my kids to public school, cool. I don't need to make enough money to send them to private school. If I want to send my kids to private school, well, now I have to make enough money to send them to private school. And so I'll have less money to give away. But all of it is dictated on that. So um, like right now in my life, I don't need um, the extra, you know, whatever dollars I'm giving to my brother to pay his rent because I don't need it right now. And I also know he needs it more than I do. So I give it to him, right? But I don't, it's not forever. It's temporary. I'm doing it because I know I can trust him to invest, you know, that um, that gesture into the future of his existence. He's not going to take advantage of me. It's I know him. You know what I mean? So I can do that. But it's not because I couldn't use that money. Sure, I could. But I don't need it right now. So I'm okay with it. But if I needed it, he would never ask it of me. He only took it because I made it clear to him I don't need it. You can have it. I'll give it to you. I'll, I don't even need it back. Just make sure you're not taking advantage of me. If you really need it for X, use it for X. And if I ever found out he wasn't using it for X, I'd be pretty fucking upset because that would go back to dishonesty and, and not living up to standards and lying and all of the things I fucking hate. But I am, I think charity is so easy to give. It is so easy to help people when you're not being taken advantage of. Everyone I know who fears helping people is just afraid of being taken advantage of because that's what's so scary about life. It is scary to think that somebody could use you like that. And as you know, it just, it happens sometimes. Sometimes it's your own family. Sometimes it's your best friend. Sometimes it's your spouse. Sometimes it's your parent. It's just how life goes, you know? But it's, yeah, I think it's all about the moment in time you're existing in. At this point in my life, I only need X amount of dollars. I just don't value having an abundance of things. It's like having like, you know, hoarding money is like hoarding tomato paste. Like how much you need, girl? How much do you really need? Okay, let's see. <clears throat> um, okay, children. Raising children to be their best matters to me. Offering them patience, love, and kindness. No spoiling, no beating, no meanness towards my kids. Reality checks are important for children, but they need... They can learn that logically, not through cruel manners. Children need structure. There are no, uh, there will be rules and expectations with the child's ability. So I think about this too. I really value a disciplined home, but I don't value my children fearing me. I don't want my kids to fear me. I think that's bullshit. But unintentionally, parents create environments in which their child now fears them, feels inclined to lie to them. And I think no matter what kind of a parent you are, you'll have that to some extent. Like I know parents who are so sweet, give their kids everything, are open to hearing them, but at the same time, are they? Like some parents who are the most open to their children are actually very impacted by when their children do things that are risky and so the child doesn't wanna tell them because they're gonna overreact, right? It's no one's evil, it's just we have limitations. We're, even parents are limited, okay? Moving on. I do want to spend my life holding grudges. If a human has shown themselves to be better, that's all I need. I have relationships with specific humans in my life that aren't perfect. They are growing. And because our realities are different, we will never have total peace. We will have a limited, inter a limited interaction within our limits. Those I unconditionally love will always have chances to come back into my life, but they will have limitations if we cannot make peace with our reality differences. So I'm, I have unconditional love not unconditional space to socialize with somebody. So I have an unconditional love for my inner circle, but I don't have the spoons to always deal with every single one of them at every every moment of every day, right? 
It's about being considerate. Um, those, oh, I read that. <coughs> okay, building a home. I've never had a home that was 100% safe until now. Um, I've never lived anywhere that wasn't a moment away from being taken away from me or me or kicking me out. My home is for me and my family. It is not a shelter. It is not a charity property. It is not a commune. It is not a open. It is not open to the public. It is not. It is for anyone. Wait. It is for anyone, but for me and my. It is not. I meant for. It is not for anyone, but for me and my family. It is a safe space, private and secluded. It is not for others to corrupt. Home will be a safe space or a safe place, and anyone who threatens it will be shown the door. Please know these values are stated that don't offer. Um, these values are stated, but don't offer every single example of how I would react in situations. I can expand on that anytime. Example, no lying, truth is important, no cheating, no abusing kids, no bestiality, and so on. These limitations can be found within the fun foundation of my value system once examined. Even if they are not listed, they exist within the system and can be discussed as needed. I'm really proud of Cross Brittany for creating this document, guys. It's fire. But building a home with somebody... <clears throat> Um, yeah, I've, I, I grew up in an environment that was really loving, but was very clear that I wasn't welcomed and that if I didn't follow the rules, I had to leave, um, whether I was young or old. So I take it very seriously, the sacredness of my home. And I've dated people in the past that would bring ho people home like stray cats. And it was a lot. And especially since I was the breadwinner, it was on me to support them. Like my partners don't like I'm. I make money, right? I always try to make money. I always try to make more money. Um, and I I understand um, that some people do this out of like charity and other people just do it to feel, to feel um, good about themselves. Like some people invite people into their life, not because they actually care, but because they want to look like they care. And um, I don't need that energy in my life. I like a really tight knit circle. I like homies. I like the idea of small communities. I'm a big proponent of, you know, small family structures, um, working together. I'm an immigrant. My parents are immigrants. So I have that immigrant mentality of, you know, we stick together, we pull each other up, we try our best. And so I think it helps me know that that's what I kind of want in my family life. You know what I mean? In order to be accessible to my children and to be available, I need to be cautious with who I give my spoons to, which is a struggle I have even with my job now. Okay, let me get rid of this though. So we can have like a conversation about it. Okay, so the point is, when you're asking yourself, like, what are your values? I would also ask myself, what kind of a life do I want to live? When you look at TV families, like, which family do you think is the best? The Simpsons, Family Guy, um, Family Matters, uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. You know, when you look at these families, which family is the one that stays, sticks out to you? So for me, um, I really hate The Simpsons and Family Guy and all those people. I think they have, like, really, like, I don't know it's just kind of like low class lives like they're not very nice to each other they're like have bad manners they're disrespectful I don't like it but when I look at Fresh Prince or uh, Family Matters or Full House um the shows I grew up with or any of those families I like their structures um they're a little too cookie cutter for me in general but Fresh Prince is probably the closest to reality you know um, without the mega nice house. But it's like life is hard. It's complicated. It's layered. There's politics involved. There's ethnicity involved. There's a lot of like maybe single parents or divorced families. There's a struggle there. But that struggle is not what's going to keep us from being successful. And so for me, I look at that struggle as a part of the life that is the hard part of life. And I think that I would like someone to go on a journey with me that accepted that life was going to be hard, but that our life could be peaceful all the same. And I think my values are are centered around that idea of how do I as a single person, as an entity, as a consciousness, have a very good and accepting understanding that life is hard while not allowing it to like put so much pressure on me that I feel like I'm sinking into a black hole of my own misery. And I think that comes um, or I think I avoid sort of sinking down into it because I can look towards my values and say, Brittany, you're still staying within them. Relax. Relax, you're fine, girl. Like I know you're panicking because you're human and your brain knows like how many times it's gone wrong in life. But if you look at your cheat sheet, which is your values, you can say, okay, but I'm still staying within my values. So I think I'm fine. I'm not fucking up again. I'm not lying again. I'm not stealing again. I'm not, you know, drowning in my depression or suicidal ideations again. I'm fine. And I know I'm fine because I have a checklist. I have a fine because I have a multiple checklist. I have checklists for relationships, for friends, for all these things, right? Values are difficult, but they're not outside of your grasp. 
You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they get to be what you want them to be. And I know this is hard because religious people will say, oh, look at the secularists deciding what's right or wrong. Yeah, bitch, just like your religion. Girl, sit the fuck down. Sit the fuck down. I can respect everyone. But the moment you try to pretend like you're better than the rest of us, like you're not struggling yourself, like the Christian, Muslim, and Mormon communities aren't fucking drowning in their scandals, please sit the fuck down, okay? We're all struggling. Stop looking for perfect. It's going to drive you crazy. But start striving for better. Or whatever that means to you. Some people don't like the word better. Um, I get it. I think I think it's fine, but I can understand why some people might not like that for their brains. Um, I hope this helped. I hope this podcast was good. I don't even know how long I've been ranting. I hope it's long enough. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys please let me know how you uh, or what you think about it, how it's impacted you, if it was good or bad, if you want me to expand upon it. Uh, many thanks to the caller who brought this up. I think, I think that was my notes. I do have one note here that says, um, Steve Jobs values. You mentioned the next 10 years of your life is going to be about. Um, is if we change our core values and start letting it slide. I can't do that. I'd rather quit. You know, you go back five years ago, what would we have done if something like this happened? You go back 10 years ago, we had the same values now as we had then. We're maybe a little more experienced, certainly more beat up, uh, but, but the core values are the same. Basically, you are the product, but you are also the maker of the product. Our consciousness, our relationship with our body and our brain and our trauma and everything in our life, like we are still the puppet masters of our of us. It's not somebody else, boo-boos. I know it feels like somebody else. It's not. It's us. That's really scary to actually realize. But when you realize like, oh, fuck, I did this to myself, by not owning the fact that I could make and have a relationship with my free will, I think that's, that's why it, life feels so hard. Because I genuinely thought somebody else was in control of my life because I had borderline, because I had PTSD, because the government, because the rapist, because this, because this, because this. And they did until they didn't, until I took that power back. You know, it's been a long time since I've had to deal with those things. And I'm so grateful for that. I really am. I'm grateful for past Brittany for doing the work. 2019 Brittany, she fucking did it. So I could be this Brittany now. You know, and look, I've stayed really consistent with all of these values. I'm monogamous now, but like, it's not because I don't think Polly's great. I just don't have the spoons. <laughs> I can't do Polly this lifetime, guys. Maybe the next one. And I don't even believe in reincarnation, but like, you know, the next time, girl. All right, guys, with that said, thank you for watching. Have the greatest day ever. And I will see you guys uh, soon. Bye. I'm okay, I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense, I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess, please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth, and living life as a fool.